Hey everybody, Ethan here. Today I'm going to talk about the Q mismatch. And I want to start with an admission. I've been away for a while, and that's because I've been trying to live my life. Thanks to the beauty that is summer break in medical school, I was able to travel a bit, go home to sunny Southern California. And as you can see in this picture, I was happy. As my buddy Eric said, it looks like I had my, it looks like I had a weight lift off my shoulders, because the truth is, I did. But as I am wont to do, you know, it's a reflex at this point, thanks to medical school, I decided to check my calendar late in the summer. And on that calendar popped up this event. And as I saw this event, well, that weight that was once off, it came right back onto my shoulders. And I really selected the following picture as going off real vibes alone to capture sort of the progression of emotions I experienced upon seeing this calendar event, right? Uh, I'm not going to really explain why, just, just go off the vibes here, right? Upon seeing the event, that's how I felt. And then afterwards, I went to here. And then after that, once in school, I felt like this, once school is back in session. And I really experienced a very similar progression upon trying to learn about VQ mismatch, right? Before even knowing what the words VQ mismatch meant, my life was pretty good. Upon hearing the words VQ mismatch, my life took a turn for the worse. And upon trying to actually learn about VQ mismatch, my life quality steadily declined. But I did put a lot of work into trying to understand VQ mismatch. And that work is why I'm here today. Speaking of today, what I will talk about today are really four questionably organized topics. What is V? What is Q? What is VQ? What is VQ mismatch? Why does supplemental auction fix VQ mismatch? And what is the real world relevance of VQ mismatch? And before I get into any of this, I want to provide a disclaimer. This is always true, but I especially feel this time it's true. I'm explaining VQ mismatch my way, which can be a plus, but also can be a negative. I encourage you to look at other resources if what I'm saying doesn't make sense. And again, this really is a more conceptual, honestly complex topic in comparison to some of the other topics I've talked about on this channel. And just as a reminder, I have no teaching credential nor any formal education in education. So take that in this as you will. That out of the way, let's get down to business. Talk about really what we're talking about most broadly today, which is the lung. We are talking about the lungs. I want to put this picture on the board. I think it's good to talk and start with a very basic idea of what the lungs do. The lungs have one job, or should I say lung job? Oh, Jesus, so good. Ignore that. It's to add oxygen and remove carbon dioxide from the blood. Not only is that a horrific pun, it's not even true. For one, there's two jobs on the screen right there, adding and removing. And for two or three, whatever number of problems I'm on right now, as my professors would tell you, if they were to watch this video, which I don't think they will because they have much better things to do with their time, lungs do much more than just add oxygen and remove carbon dioxide and blood from blood. But I just want to focus on these two for now and for the purpose of this video. Because doing these two jobs requires two main things to happen. You first have to perfuse blood in the alveoli, ca alveolar capillaries. You need to move blood to be in contact with the alveoli. That's perfusion, right? You got to put blood in position. And then once blood's in position with perfusion, you got to ventilate the alveoli. So this is perfusion surgical called in red here. Then you want to ventilate them. You need to make sure gas can enter the alveoli so that oxygen can diffuse into the blood and carbon dioxide can diffuse out of the blood. The analogy I like to use is like cafeteria, right? You got to get people in line to get their food, which is like perfusion. And once they're in line, you got to get the food on their plates, which is like ventilation, right? Get blood in position, perfusion, get oxygen into blood, carbon dioxide out, ventilation. You need both. And just like anyone who stood in a long cafeteria line can tell you, the goal here is balance. It doesn't matter how fast you can serve food. There's no one in line for food. It doesn't matter how many people are in line if you can't serve food quickly enough, right? This underlies the basic idea of what the VQ ratio is, which is a ratio that compares ventilation to perfusion. Again, ventilation is the ability for air to reach the alveoli and new gas exchange. Perfusion is the ability for blood to reach the alveoli via capillaries. As such, a high VQ ratio means you have well-ventilated poorly perfused regions of lung or poorly perfused alveoli. And the result is well oxygenated because that ventilation is good, that V is high, and a small quantity of blood because that perfusion is low, the Q is low. A low VQ unit area of lung is poorly ventilated because the V is low, but well perfused because the Q is high, right? Because of that ratio of how math, the, the division works. This leads to poorly oxygenated larger quantity of, quantities of blood. And this is really a nice segue in actually talking about the subject of this video, which is 
VQ mismatch, which is an imbalance in the VQ ratio with some areas of high VQ and some areas of low VQ. Let's go talk about those high and low VQ ratios to begin with. I bolded this part in black here because it helps underlie one of the problems when you have a mismatch in VQ ratio. You need both V and Q in a match ratio to achieve our lung, okay, I'm going to stop that, achieve our job of add, adding oxygen to the blood. I know I mentioned CO2 earlier, but for the purpose of the video, I'm now only going to focus on oxygen. I'm cutting, just cutting out, cutting out, cutting out stuff. This video is going to be long enough. And the reason why I'm only going to focus on oxygen is because uh, VQ mismatch really affects oxygen much more than carbon dioxide. So we're really going to focus on oxygen more. Uh, yeah, hypoxemia is much bigger risk when it comes to VQ mismatch than compared to hypercapnia. Why? Watch a different video. Apologies. But focusing on oxygen, if you have a lung region with super high VQ, you can do a lot of gas exchange and get blood oxygenated because Q is small. And because by definition is a ratio, you're not going to have a lot of blood coming out of these high VQ unit regions. The opposite is true with low VQ. You have a lot of blood. Perfusion's high because Q is big in a low VQ unit region, but it's not well ventilated and therefore not well oxygenated. So it's not like there's a balance here of well oxygenated and well ventilated blood. And that lack of balance is the fundamental reason why the high VQ ratio alveoli can't compensate for low VQ ratio alveoli. Because you might be thinking, Ethan, as long as the total ratio is equal, who cares if sum's high, sum's low, they all balance out in the end, right? And sure, you might be asking, Ethan, why, does heck, why the heck does anything you're saying matter? It's always a good question to ask me and let me answer that. Let me continue to answer that, I guess. As I was mentioned before, the key thing to remember about the difference between low VQ and high VQ regions of lung is not only that one is going to be well oxygenated and one is going to be poorly oxygenated. It's that there's simply going to be more of that poorly oxygenated blood in comparison to that well oxygenated blood. High VQ ratio alveoli, yes, are well oxygenated, but there's a smaller volume of them compared to the larger volume of poorly oxygenated low VQ unit blo uh, alveoli blood. Uh, an analogy I like to use to help sort of illustrate this is the idea of trying to use a thimble full of salt water to make a bathtub of fresh water salty. Yes, the thimble, in this case, the blood coming out of those high VQ unit alveoli, is well oxygenated. It is salty. But there's just a larger volume of blood coming out of low VQ unit alveoli, which are poorly oxygenated. So the mix, right, once all those capillaries mix in the pulmonary vasculature, the mix is going to be poorly oxygenated. And if that wasn't enough, in this bad metaphor, that bathtub is very unsalty and the thimble isn't actually that salty. What do I mean by that? I mean, I'm talking about this curve. You may remember it, it's the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. And yes, in this picture, we see shifts to the pH, but ignore that for now. Let's just focus on this blue curve. What this shows is that even subtle drops in the oxygen partial pressure of, of, of oxygen in blood, right, can lead to very significant drops in the hemoglobin saturation of said blood. And because we know that hemoglobin saturation is the most important determinant of oxygen caught in blood, Yes, there's oxygen dissolved in blood, but the bigger, bigger, the chunk, most of the oxygen is attached to hemoglobin. That decrease in hemoglobin saturation can really lead to a pretty significant drop in the O2 content of blood. In comparison, right, so so first off, this, this drop, right, is what you see in a low VQ unit region. If you're not able to ventilate the blood, even a slight decrease in that oxygen partial pressure can lead to a pretty significant nonlinear drop in the hemoglobin saturation, which can lead to a pretty significant nonlinear drop in the oxygen content of said low VQ unit blood. On the other hand, let's talk about that high VQ unit blood. Yes, we already mentioned there's less of it, which is a problem because that means just by volume alone, you can't balance out the low VQ unit blood. But to make matters worse, let's say you're able to pump up the partial pressure of oxygen in that high VQ unit blood. Let's say even somehow, even though I don't think it's physically possible, you pumped up the oxygen partial pressure of your high VQ unit alveolar blood to the same partial pressure of oxygen in room air. You start breathing like the speed of sound. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna stop at this horrible impersonations, right? Even if you did that, watch how this curve levels out here. There's really diminishing returns in terms of oxygenation of blood due to the diminishing returns of hemoglobin saturation when it comes to higher partial pressures of oxygen. So what this means is not only are high VQ unit regions small in terms of their volume of blood, you can't even dial up the oxygen content of that blood a ton to counterbalance the pretty significant drops in oxygen content you see in low VQ unit blood because, again, of how this curve works. As you increase the partial pressure at these high 
at these high partial pressures, you don't actually see like oversaturation of that hemoglobin. Because again, the hemoglobin is already saturated at like, I don't know, 70, 80, 90 millimeters of mercury. So you can't dial up the oxygen content of blood super high in these high VQ unit regions. So that was a bit disorganized. What are my organized thoughts? VQ mismatch occurs when parts of lung experience disproportionate ventilation and perfusion. A high VQ unit region has high ventilation, low VQ, or low perfusion. Oh my goodness, I'm misspeaking, sorry. Whereas low VQ regions are the opposite, high perfusion, low ventilation. These regions don't balance out, even if total lung VQ is relatively balanced out, because of two main things. One, high VQ unit regions, by definition, don't have much perfusion. Therefore, there's a lower amount of well-ventilated blood coming out of them compared to the low VQ unit regions. And to make matters worse, due to how the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curves work, the well-ventilated blood experiences diminishing returns in the oxygen saturation and therefore oxygen content, even as you dial up the partial pressure of oxygen in said blood. Whereas, on the other hand, drops in the partial pressure of oxygen experienced in those low VQ units of low VQ unit regions of lung exhibit a steep drop, a nonlinear drop in oxygen saturation, meaning that those the blood leaving low VQ unit regions is very poorly oxygenated. And it's not like the high VQ unit regions are like hyper oxygenated. They're not, right? So um you might be wondering then, I, I talked a lot about like room air, 160 millimeters of room air. And one of the things we talked about from the top was, oh, supplement oxygen fixing VQ mismatch. Why do I talk about that? The reason why we I talk about room air so much, supplement oxygen, is that because a key tell that a patient is experiencing VQ mismatch and not, say, shunt physiology is that their SATs should improve when placed on supplemental oxygen. You might ask then, why is this the case? Uh, why does more O2 fix VQ mismatch? Let's go back to our oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. Before, this was our nemesis, right? Because pumping up ventilation in high VQ unit regions brought us diminishing returns in hemoglobin saturation and therefore oxygen content. But on the other hand, dropping that partial pressure of oxygen in those low VQ re unit regions led to a really precipitous drop in hemoglobin saturation and therefore oxygen content. But remember, as I bolded many times, this was on room air where oxygen has a partial pressure of about 160 millimeters of mercury and constitutes only about 21% of said room air. If we pump that up to pure oxygen, deliver 100% oxygen with a significantly higher partial pressure, then we can get decent ventilation even in low VQ unit regions of lung. What do I mean by this? Let's go back to this picture of the alveoli. And let's say this is a low VQ unit alveoli because I don't know, there's some kind of obstruction seen here with this black oval, right? That obstruction prevents, you know, full flow of air going into the alveoli, which compromises the volume of air we can bring in, which compromises, obviously, the ventilation of said alveoli, causing low VQ units. But what if we were pulling pure oxygen in this alveoli? Sure, it would be a low volume because of this black mass, right? But it doesn't matter that it's a low volume because we're pulling in pure oxygen, meaning the driving force for diffusion between this pure oxygen in the alveoli and the deoxygenated blood in the alveolar capillaries seen here is going to be very strong. The driving force for diffusion will be very strong. And that, that helps counteract the fact there won't be that much gas coming in because, again, of this obstruction. It doesn't matter that ventilation is so poor because we're able to adequately oxygenate the blood because the, 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 the air we're bringing in is so heavily oxygenated. After all, it's pure oxygen. This way, we can correct the hypoxemia caused by low ventilation and oxygenate blood adequately in these low VQ unit regions. This helps fix VQ mismatch because it allows for the oxygenation of these low VQ, units, low VQ unit regions of lung, which we discussed before, are the key things holding us back from you know, achieving normal concentrations of oxygen in blood when we're experiencing VQ mismatch. So again, coming back to the dissociation curve, when we talk about using supplemental oxygen in these low VQ unit regions of lung, this curve becomes our friend, not our foe. We might be piping in 200, 300, God knows how many millimeters of mercury of mercury of oxygen into the alveoli when we give a patient some more oxygen. And because of that ventilation issue, because it's low VQ after all, we're not going to be able to expect, nor do we need to actually get the partial pressure of oxygen up to 200, 300, 400, whatever. Every little bit 
of increase in partial pressure of oxygen in this low VQ unit blood, say from here to here, has a really large nonlinear increase in the hemoglobin saturation of blood and therefore the oxygen content of blood, right? Even just like a 10 or 20 millimeter of mercury increase in partial pressure in the capillary blood can cause a 20% or more increase in the hemoglobin saturation, which can really increase, right? The oxygen content of said blood coming out of these low VQ unit areas. This in effect, helps us fix the, fix the hypoxemia caused by VQ mismatch, at least until we get to the bottom of what's actually causing said VQ mismatch. And that's a nice segue to my last talk, which is why does any of this matter? It matters because first, VQ mismatch is the most common cause of hypoxemia. And I wanna first add a little qualifier here. VQ mismatch isn't always necessarily bad. Technically, actually even healthy lungs have some degree of VQ mismatch because the apices atop of the lung actually have higher VQ when compared to the bottom. This sort of makes sense if you just think about blood, right? And gravity. Gravity is gonna pull blood more towards the bottom of the lung, meaning you get better perfusion in the bottom of the lung. And as perfusion drops off as you go higher in the lung, you're gonna have higher VQs at the top. Ventilation technically drops off too as you go higher, but Ventilation drops off slower than perfusion drops off. So that's why the VQ ratio at the top is higher than the bottom. So there is some degree of mismatch in a healthy lung, but this mismatch can be exacerbated with a number of pulmonary conditions from asthma to COPD to interstitial lung disease to pulmonary hypertension. All of these can exhibit VQ mismatch related hypoxemia. And the why, let's just think through briefly why. Let's say, let's take asthma, right? What do we have in asthma? We have bronchoconstriction, we have hyperactivity. That's gonna cause these local ventilation problems, which will cause obviously low VQ unit regions and um, VQ mismatch as a result. Or let's take uh, interstitial pulmonary fibrosis. Um, this honeycombing pattern you see on CT scans corresponds to these abnormally large air spaces. There's a lot of vascular obliteration in this disease, meaning that again, vascular obliteration, there's no capillaries, perfusion can be a problem you create high VQ unit regions and therefore VQ mismatch. Again, I'm not going to delve deep into any of this pathophysiology, but I just want this to make clear is that there is no like restriction to, ooh, another wordplay here. There's no restriction to restrictive or obstructive lung diseases. You can see this in a lot of lung diseases, and that's why VQ mismatch is such a common cause of hypoxemia. So what I talk about today, a lot of stuff. First, ventilation. It's just the ability to get gas in the alveoli to do gas exchange. Then perfusion get blood in those alveolar capillaries. Both are required to really get oxygen in and carbon dioxide out. High VQ ratio is high ventilation, low perfusion, while low VQ ratio is low ventilation, high perfusion. High VQ unit areas cannot compensate for low VQ unit areas because there's a smaller amount of blood in those high VQ unit regions, right? And there's diminishing amount of returns we get from ventilating on room air, right? You can't pump up the oxygen in a ton in high VQ unit areas, but you can drop the oxygen a ton due to poor ventilation in those low VQ unit areas. Supplemental oxygen helps fix the hypoxemia caused by VQ mismatch by oxygenating the blood of low VQ unit areas of lungs. There's such a strong diffusion driving force when you're pumping in pure oxygen, even if there is some kind of ventilation defect in these regions of lung. And lastly, VQ mismatch is the most common cause of hypoxemia and is a consequence of a variety of pulmonary diseases. Thank you all for staying this long. If hopefully this was at least a little bit helpful, here are my references. I wish you all the best. Take care. Have a good one. Bye-bye.